and welcome back to the Donahue Group. I hope you're ready for another fun half hour of lively discussion and uh, uh, interesting insights on behalf of our panel members. I'm going to start with the, the man in black, Ken Risto. <laughs> Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash. Oh, Johnny yeah. Cash. Johnny Cash. He, he, well, he, or he at least tries to. Uh, <laughs> and jumped we'll, into a few burning rings of fire. Uh, yeah. And we're going to move right on so we don't get too many cliches. Too bogged down just in the introductions, much Don't less the content. Soup. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Paneski, our guy in orange today, is uh, or salmon. Peach or whatever salmon. I'm salmon. going to say something. I deliver meals on wheels, and one of my one of the people I deliver to always watches the program. So hi, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth. Very nice. Yeah. That's very <laughs> nice. Kind of hi, mom. <laughs> hi, mom. One of our ten loyal listeners. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we're building an audience. Like Ray Miller, one of our <laughs> ten loyal viewers. <laughs> I'll get through these introductions yet. Yeah. And Cal Potter, who's, um, would, and if there's anyone that you would care to greet. No, not really. <laughs> All right. Very good. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, and I'm going to try to hold on to these guys here and uh, as we launch into our discussion. Um, talking about state issues, and um, we didn't get to a state program uh, last month, but there's lots and lots happening. Um, Right now, the um, assembly is working on the um, ethics package that was defeated, or wasn't defeated, was never brought up for a final vote in the uh, legislature last session. A proposal to combine the ethics board and uh, the uh, state elections board, um, not a bad idea. As I understand, it passed the assembly uh, judiciary and ethics committee by a 8-1 hmm, vote, um, but there are, there are some rumblings, um, and one is the non-severability clause, which says that if, if one part's bad, the whole part is bad. Uh, I think that's to um, avoid the McCain-Feingold issue mm -hmm. where the court was able to say part of the law is okay, part of the law isn't. Um, severability clauses from a legal perspective are pretty standard. I mean, it's, it's certainly not an unusual concept at all, so it would be kind of sad to see things um, go down on, on that basis. I think this is going to pass in any way that is going to be an improvement? Well, I think the concept and the, and the structure of eliminating the two boards, the ethics board and the elections board, is, I think, popularly uh, accepted, both amongst Democrats and Republicans. Uh, the bill that's before the assembly is a, a sit-down meeting product between these Republicans and Democrats, because the Democrats control uh, the governorship as well as the Senate, but don't control the, the House, the Assembly. So I think the eight to one vote is saying that, well, if they got an agreement, let's advance it. But there are groups like Common Cause and others who are looking at the details, and the, the trouble is in the details. And whether, the, yep. whether the floor amendments will sufficiently uh, change it is another thing. But since the governor was involved in the original drafting of it, if it ends up on his desk in a very similar form, of course he's going to sign it. Now, whether the details that are being um, criticized are, are true, true to form to be pro pro problematic, well, that's going to be what the courts and others will decide down the pike. But I think, yeah, it's going to pass. Uh, there's been enough hoopla for them not doing anything last session, uh, both uh, in the gubernatorial race and legislative races, that, and there's a, there's a, uh, a bill before them, so and why not pass it? At least you can say, well, we've done something, mm -hmm. and we did it expeditiously. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, it may be a flawed product, but at least we did our thing, and I think that's what's going to drive this whole thing, mm -hmm. and whether the critics are going to get any traction or not, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I was just trying to think about the whole process, the political process of putting a bill together. And if you allow pieces to be knocked out because they're unconstitutional, I think you could get more people on uh, the bill to sign on to the bill because, you know, okay, I'll, I know this piece is going to get knocked out. I got my part that I want. But if you say one, one piece is unconstitutional, the whole thing is unconstitutional. Then you really want to craft a bill so that nothing is unconstitutional. Or you want to craft a bill so one thing is. Or one thing is, that's the other. And you can vote other. for it and then. And you can then, vote for it and it still gets thrown out. Yeah. 
yeah. Thank well, you. Yeah, a poison pill. So exactly. I, don't, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, it could be unconstitutional two years later, and you had these, this board going for two years, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it, they, they have to disband and go back to the, the previous election right. board and the accountability board. What aspects of the legislation are being discussed as possibly running afoul? Of the Constitution. I don't I'm know. assuming, are we talking about Wisconsin's Constitution or the federal? Well, it could be either. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, the, right. those rights oh, would yeah, endure under both, <coughs> under both constitutions. There isn't much discussion. One of the sticking points, which to me is as odd as can be, is if you were a legislator uh, or any elected official who is, is caught doing something wrong, where will your trial be? <laughs> Who would have thought that that would be a major issue? But it appears to be something that is at least Fred dividing, <laughs> dividing, <laughs> dividing the, the parties. Um, I suppose the thought is that if I'm popular in my home district, even though I have been doing something wrong, my chances of being convicted are substantially less than if I'm being tried in Dane County, where everyone is is aware of, you know, how bad I am and. Well, yeah, where, we where? should we should double back a little bit for our ten loyal listeners and viewers. Um, the current law legislation, correct me if I'm wrong, states that if there is evidence of wrongdoing, the material or evidence is turned over to the local district attorney of the legislator's home district. That's and what that's what's causing some discussion about whether that's got enough teeth in it because there's a concern that the local district attorney might be beholden to this lawmaker and less likely to prosecute? Well, the Constitution, it doesn't require, but it states that the, the typically the venue or where you would hold the case would be in the county where the crime right. occurred. Right. Correct. So Blanchard and, has been the lead person in Madison. And, right. and he's fairly aggressive. And yes. So where we've had uh, violations of campaign finance laws, et cetera, et cetera, by several legislatures. Where were all those trials held? All in those, Dane County. In they Dane were County. all in Dane, Dane County, County, so now Absolutely. they want them to go back to the local district. Right, you know, where, where everybody knows you and, yeah. you know, the guy who, you know, sells your car and the, the dry cleaner, you know, those are going to be the people who are on the jury. It seems to me to be a relatively silly thing to fight about because wouldn't it be good if we aren't having people tried <laughs> for various crimes and misdemeanors about, uh, you know, finance and... Yeah, if you and fix, fix the system of financing exactly. or the ethics uh, prohibitions, beef them up so that people aren't taking free this or that uh, and getting caught doing it or using staff, for example, in campaigns, mm -hmm. Well, obviously, we wouldn't have this argument mm -hmm. over, so it's actually treating a symptom and not the disease. Exactly. And I think it gets back to this whole issue of campaign financing and how we're going to run our campaigns. Mm -hmm. And that's the other bill that needs to be taken up that's getting not a lot of press. I don't even know if there's something been introduced, uh, such as the Ellis bill that was in last session. And I mean, that's really, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, that's where the disease is. Yeah. And that's the hard part to, to cure. And, uh, and there isn't a whole lot of talk about that. I expect the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign and the Common Cause folks are concerned that if a bill like this passes, kind of like McCain-Feingold passing, and well, now all of, our, all of our troubles are over, and well, clearly that's not the case. And, uh, and so they're looking for, uh, for more, more and real and significant changes. Political change is slow, yeah. and uh, particularly when the actors... Pocketbook issues, they're not talking about pocketbook issues, right. they're talking about How we police issues. ourselves, yes, yeah. yes. Um, the um, uh, the uh, proposal before the legislature also uh, uh, creates, which I think is just interesting, a six-member panel of retired judges to oversee secret investigations of potential ethics lobbying and election law violations. Now, will there be a suspension of habeas corpus is what I want to know. <laughs> will, will the Military Powers Commission Act uh, somehow <laughs> take away? Will we well, have a star chamber? In, well, back to the pack, Mary <laughs> If you're bringing in stuff pack. from Canada, you know, that's out of the country. You never know. <laughs> I don't know. I just, uh, I like... This, this concept of secret investigations, although there, it, is, it is the case that at a certain point in an, in an investigation of anything, it certainly is helpful if not everybody knows what's going on. I'm, mm -hmm. 
I'll grant you that. But uh, in any event, so I, I think that's interesting. What I like about this panel is that it replaces a body that's citizen appointees that are equally uh, divided between both parties. And so when a decision is made about whether something ought to be, uh, candidate ought to be prosecuted in some way uh, for an, an, an issue that's brought to the elections board, it often is very closely uh, voted upon by partisan politics. Hopefully, with a panel of judges, people who played hardball for much of their career in the legal profession uh, and can smell out a law violation when they see it, um, they will be in a better position, and you'll have better confidence that they're going to proceed against somebody who truly did violate the law or did something unethical. So I think the, the mechanism for screening and proceeding is one that has a lot more validity than the old election board panel of citizens made up on partisan politics basis. Right, and, and the way that judges get appointed, um, at the very beginning, the Senate confirms three of the first six board members, the Assembly confirms the other three, and then after that, future appointees would be uh, need confirmation from two thirds of the Senate. So there would still be that element of politics, I think, in terms of you know who gets appointed and who doesn't. But I think you're exactly right, is that um, for the most part, I think judges in the state of Wisconsin are held in fairly high esteem. And who well, nominates? Two -thirds. Who nominates the retired judges? Well, I was just about Good. to say, but the two-thirds requirement would really require, unless politics changes dramatically in Wisconsin, will require at least some compromise between the parties and candidates that will be at least perceived as somewhat fair. Um, you know, and I'm looking at the Journal Sentinel article, and it doesn't say. Yeah. I presume it would be the governor who would nominate. You would think so. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, I mean, that's you typically you, you know. wouldn't have the body that has two thirds uh, majority right. in the Senate <clears throat> appointing the people in the first place. It comes from some other source, and then you just confer, like you do on the national level as well. Right. The president uh, appoints judges, and then you get a, a vote of the Senate. Mm -hmm. I would think that's the mechanism here. Yeah, yeah. but. Uh, well, we'll have to watch, watch and wait and see how things develop. I note that the um, U.S. House of Representatives did its 100-hour um, um, charade. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what else did New you say? New minimum wage <laughs> bills, you know, just, okay. uh, just those silly little things that are meaningless. But uh, in any event, it does not appear that the Wisconsin legislature will be on a 100 hour, hour yeah. and maybe not a 100 day, <laughs> but uh, at, least, uh, at least we could, <laughs> we could hope for I'm something. I'm inclined to agree with you about that. <laughs> Let the record reflect <laughs> that there is agreement. Um, other things that are going on in the state uh, these days, and we've touched on it a little bit in our, um, in our last show, uh, and I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the um, on a possible um, uh, reversal of the qualified economic uh, offer, the QEO, which teachers have complained about bitterly. And it is true that there has been no other body that has had to bear that particular financial structure. It has been only teachers, not the janitors or custodial staff or secretaries in the school or firefighters or police. I mean, it really has been just strictly limited to teachers, which I think has been a little unfair. To, to put it mildly. I'm what a teacher. Do <laughs> I don't belong to a union. I'm at the whim of the legislature. Some years I get zero raise. Some years I get a percent, you know. When it gets bad enough, you this guys is, will organize. <laughs> this, yeah, the universities aren't organized. Yeah, we have no union. We're at the whim I didn't know that, Tom. Really? Yeah. I wasn't have, aware of that. They yeah. uh, have repeatedly, I'm glad I some came to of the, the show people <laughs> in the university have repeatedly asked for collective bargaining rights, but what, uh, when I chaired the Education Committee, I probably held at least eight to ten hearings on that Is topic that right? over the years. And I would have generally uh, some very rank and file people from particularly outstate campuses. And then all of a sudden, then came the law faculty or the medical school faculty, the upper echelon. Oh, we don't need us. We have self governance. Uh, yeah. We'll take care of ourselves. Uh, so. When the house is divided, it doesn't pass, it doesn't. and that's basically. But uh, TAs and a few uh, the teaching oh, assistants yeah, they, they have they have they have gotten the right sure. to organize. Yes. But my where I think one of the huge public policy challenges for the state is, and, and we touched on it a little bit, and it's the whole taxation system, of course, which is a fairly large thing to put your arms around, but just how we are funding 
school districts. Some school districts get 65% from the state, some get 70, some get 51, all depending on, on odd formulas, where they were at, where a particular district was at when the law was enacted, whether they're growing enrollment, whether they're a diminishing enrollment, there's a three-year averaging, as I understand. Types of the student population, um, it's to a certain degree. It's exceptionally, it's exceptionally complicated, mm -hmm. and uh, different rural areas have different issues than 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 highly urbanized areas, suburban areas, and, and so forth. So I think, from my perspective, that's a, that's a huge, a huge issue. That if we had, if we could just step. There's nothing wrong with partisan politics, but if we could just have a couple steps up above the scrapping and, and say, this is a big issue. Well, how should we deal with this? Um, and and an, get people an to the table. Eventually recruiting good people to be teachers. Mm -hmm. um, before, when the, before we had binding arbitration, which was enacted uh, under the uh, Marty Schreiber administration, it was a very- after the Hortonville teacher strike of Hortonville, the, uh, here's a who. <laughs> in, in the early 70s, yeah. um, we enacted binding arbitration, and that uh, did bring teacher salaries up to respectability. And to the extent that teachers in Wisconsin were usually in the top 10 in compensation. Um, what you have seen now, after a decade or so of the QEO, is that we are no longer in the top ten. I don't know. We're in the middle. We're, we're, we're in the we're middle of the pack. 30th, yeah. actually, yes. for starting salaries in about and 25. That does not mm. say very much about recruiting of good people in a state that prides itself on having good teachers and uh, good institutions that prepare teachers. Um, kids are savvy enough to know that if they can make a buck more in California or Texas or somewhere else, Eventually, ranking 30th is not going to be a very good selling point for people to stay in their home state to teach. So you can play this game of saying the QEOs makes it easy for school boards, and school boards love it, um, and it, it's nice to control property tax, but there is a public policy issue here, is how, how long do you screw teachers um, and then have uh, difficulty getting good, the best and brightest of your young people to go into teaching. Why would you want to do that? I mean, when you can find other professions that pay a lot more. So what I'm saying is this state probably can't afford another five years of a QAO without addressing the issue of where we're headed in compensating teachers. Yeah. Well, and where the whole system is going and how yeah. do we fund it? Mm -hmm. And is the property tax anachronistic? Should we, right. should we be Change, just looking at it? I mean, take at the a university system, though. I mean, uh, the issues with the university system. Administrators, uh, some of our the chancellors and the president, compared to other Big Ten states or other states, they tend to be low, uh, and that's because we've been very stingy with dollars. Even though they, we pride ourselves in the university, uh, we've been the university is we the last two budgets we've been on the chopping block as far as dollars, but there was a whole. That was just most recent, but it's been that way for a while. Yeah. So we pride ourselves with our university education, but uh, we're in the same situation. You want to fund quality teachers. You want teachers, university professors to come, contribute their expertise to the state. They'll go elsewhere. Yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, these are just huge issues, yeah. and uh, we're not a poor state. Yeah. And, and it's difficult to say we ought to, there are some politicians who do say, well, let's, let's just take education completely off the property tax. Well, you know, there are other avenues that, that are looked at, but they're not always easily the resolvable item either. Uh, going totally to the sales tax might be a little uh, less pressure on the, on the property tax, but the property tax is still deductible. Well, the governor so, two years ago, or a year ago or so, had a commission of people, I know Mark Hanna here from Sheboygan was a part of that oh, commission, yeah made a variety of recommendations and tried to move some of the funding of schools, public schools, I don't believe the university was part of that package, uh, t more toward an increase in the sales tax, if I'm not mistaken. That commission report pretty much is gathering dust someplace mm -hmm. in a, sure. in a well, corner of Madison. It's always difficult to raise another tax. Um, right. But what I, I guess what I was, I was going to say also is that the property tax, while it's regressive and onerous, it is also federally 
deductible. So if you're in a 25% tax bracket and your property tax bill is 4,000 uh, bucks, the feds are in essence are paying 1,000 bucks of your property tax bill. Right. I mean, it, it, it's not something you see right off the top, but it, there is a relief yes. to it where the sales tax is not deductible, nor is your income tax uh, you know, that de deductible. So it's one of these things where uh, the property tax is, is, is a bad tax, but it does have some redeeming quality in the sense that uh, it's deductible. Um, just to segue into a totally different area, and, and I don't think any of us at this point know a whole lot, but it seems to me that the discussion of universal health insurance and health care coverage is moving closer and closer to a reality at the national level to some extent, but really at the state level. I mean, there are some interesting proposals out there which are going to cost a ton of dough, uh, but that will work with employers and small employers uh, and the large ones like Walmart um, and really make universal health care available to, to citizens in the state. To me, the discussion is much more concrete and focused. There are plans out there that are being discussed. Bush isn't going to give a plan tonight. Well, it's Bob Dole's old plan. Don't get sick. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Well, that was that's what I do. <laughs> that's, that's your payback for the charade. Yeah, yeah charade. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> now we're even. Now, now we're, we're even. even. Okay, there back you to your yeah, Well, I don't want to yeah. get sick. Thank you. I, 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 it's not fun. Yeah, yeah, we're, while we're, yeah, you're right. As While we're taping, um, the State of the Union will be tonight, and uh, one of the things that's been leaked anyway to the media is the president's going to start speaking about um, the proposal that I read was after fifteen thousand dollars of health care benefits, if you receive it from your employ your employer, mm -hmm. uh, that in that amount will be taxed. I assume it's your tax bracket, which is for mm -hmm. most of us around twenty five percent, as Cal was saying, um, at least around this table anyway, I think, and. He was also encouraging and then purchase those, of and your then, own and then, insurance yeah, and then the reverse a tax write-off. Right, and the reverse side, the, mo the monies there would be offset by, if you got your own health care plan, the... HSAs. Yeah, you'd, you'd end up being able to tax right off the... The, the cost. Pay the cost of those health care plans. Yeah. Yeah. So that'd be some tax savings to the individual. So mm -hmm. he's trying to put, make it, the way I understand, he's trying to make it more of a free market enterprise so mm -hmm. that health insurance instead of being government operated, uh, thrives in a free market and costs will be, will be uh, held in check a little bit. No, well, healthcare has certainly been thriving in, 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 a, in a free market environment to the, you know, to the tune of 18, 20, 25 percent increases per year. So, and there's always been that tension between having a highly regulated government system, which although the Medicare system, as I understand it, is extremely efficient, yes, is. only 4 percent of Medicare costs are related to administrative costs. So in terms of actual administration, if other health insurance plans were as effective and as efficient as Medicare, things would be, things would be better. But there seems to be a built-in escalation factor for sure, or at least there has been. Plus, so you have, you have a complete government side and then, and then the, the free market side where I see people in my office on a regular basis and it's the kind of work I do, but who literally do not have health insurance. And although they can go to an emergency room mm -hmm. on a, you know, on a, to get health care, that's really not accessible care for them. They shouldn't be there. And they shouldn't be there. It's very expensive yeah. care, and it's a, a mismanagement yeah. of our resources. But I think the models that are coming up seem to have some nice interaction and... Um, more people are buying into it. For years, it was always sort of the liberal mm -hmm. or labor pushing these things. Mm -hmm. And business kind of sat back, even though they were biting and biting the bullet of higher premiums and not being able to provide insurance for their employees. Mm -hmm. They're getting hit so hard now that they're finally starting to say, well, I'd like to come to the table, too, and let's talk about this. So I don't know if it's the pot is boiled sufficiently mm -hmm. yet to, to have this porridge uh, be made into law. but I. I I think some of the states are being very creative mm -hmm. in suggestions, and I think the role of the feds ought to be, let's, let, let's encourage the states, let's provide a framework for the states to do some good things. Hawaii's done something, Massachusetts has done something. Oregon, uh, I guess. Oregon, mm -hmm. and I think uh, 
do the whole experiment and maybe we're going to find some really good ideas and some good ways of delivering a service at a reasonable cost. Um, I just hope that uh, in this state, both houses of the legislature and the governor take the lead in trying to say, let's see if we can put together a plan. And I hope the feds don't stand in the way and screw it up is what, I, what I'm saying, because I mm -hmm. think states can be creative. There's a, one model that's a pan, uh, patterned after workers' comp, which is a very reasonable way of providing health, uh, insurance to people, uh, both for the employee and the employer. And I think uh, the state ought to be looking at some of these options. Yeah. Well, I think it's I think it's an economic imperative. The QEO wouldn't be such a bad deal if, out of the 3.8 percent you get, 3.6 percent is going for uh, increased health insurance costs, and you get 0.2 percent of a raise, for example. So I think those are, I think those are some of the issues. We only have a couple of minutes left. It's a new era in Wisconsin state politics. Um, the um, I was, as we talked about, I was stunned <laughs> that the Democrats took over the Senate. And really, there are just a couple of races in the Assembly that were determined by 100 votes mm -hmm. or fewer that could have flipped that. Um, any prognostications about what the, the governor and the legislature are going to accomplish, say, in the next year or two? Not a Galdern thing, huh? Uh, yeah. well, <laughs> no clue. well, I think you're going to see a lot of things come out of the Senate uh, because the Democrats feel mm -hmm. that they've got to deliver mm -hmm. now that they've gotten their majority. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Assembly, I don't know, with new leadership there, you know, there's been some changes in the leadership, whether they're going to be amenable to sit down and put their version together and go into a conference committee, or they're just going to be obstructionists and say, we don't want that stuff that's coming from the Senate, we're just going to kill it. So I think there's a lot to do with the, the issue of cooperation between the two houses. And do you well, think Doyle? Yeah, you could, the, the Assembly could put up a nice package and the Senate could kill it. Right. And I just want to play the other side, you know, because... I guess it would be my hope that Doyle would play a real leadership role now that he is not in that same bunker-like mentality that I think was certainly a fair way to describe the first term. Uh, and I guess it would be my hope that, because uh, I think he is a talented leader, uh, I think he's had you know, some clear ups and downs, and it would be my hope that he'd be able to work with the legislature and kind of move things forward. Mm -hmm. But we'll see. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again.